The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. A young man approached Jesus and said, Teacher, what good must I do to gain eternal life? He answered him, Why do you ask me about the good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He asked him, Which ones? And Jesus replied, You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young, man's, the young man said to him, All of these things I have observed. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this statement, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, brothers and sisters. So we might begin with that prayer to St. Monica. St. Monica, troubled wife and mother, many sorrows pierced your heart during your lifetime, yet you never despaired or lost faith. With confidence, persistence, and profound faith, you pray daily for the conversion of your beloved husband, Patricius, and your beloved son, Augustine. Grant me that same fortitude, patience, and trust in the Lord. Intercede for me, dear Saint Monica, far, and here we think of the person or persons that we wish to pray for. And grant me the grace to accept his will in all things through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So St. Augustine, St. Monica's son, is a big, big figure. He's um, probably, it's fair to say, the greatest mind and the greatest thinker and the greatest writer in the history of the Church. And that's saying something indeed over 2,000 years it's, of course, apart, apart from the 12 apostles themselves. So, for example, in the Catechism in 1992, nobody was quoted more than St. Augustine. And so it was the Bible and St. Augustine especially. And St. Augustine wrote huge, huge books, books that are quite simply almost too big to read for most people today. And he had gave these most wonderful sermons that everybody looks back to today when they, when they look to a sermon, and you can see that he really spoke to the people and spoke to their heart, and that they must have been giving him the amen and all these things, uh, even though he lived so long ago. But for all his brilliance and all his writing and all his genius, there was one thing that he had a very simple faith in, and that was in his mother's prayers. And he writes very beautifully about it at many different times when he, he writes about his life in uh, the confessions that he wrote. But he also writes that sometimes his mother's prayers had the opposite effect of what she wanted. So one case in particular was that he decided for professional reasons that he was going to go and work in Italy. So he crossed the Mediterranean and his mother held on to him, held his arm, and he had to lie to his mother. He had to say, oh, well, I won't be going for a few days. And then he slipped out overnight and his mother was left there crying and banging the ground in disgust. So he was conscious that his mother was praying that he wouldn't go away but that he'd stay close by and be under her influence as much as possible and he said all the time God was working it out in the opposite way. That when he went away to Italy that was precisely when he met St. Ambrose and he was converted. So he was conscious that, that God was working out her prayers, but in a way that she never expected. So he writes at one stage, in your deepest counsels, Lord, 
you heard the crux of her desire. But St. Augustine says to God, you had no care for what she was looking for at that moment. You had no care for what she was looking for at that moment so that you might do for me what she looked for forever, which was, of course, to come to faith. So God was working out things in answer to her prayers, yet not at all as she would have expected. As a matter of fact, she was probably frustrated and angry and depressed by God that uh, he was that Augustine was doing exactly the opposite of what she wanted and what she was praying for, as if God was ignoring her all this time and things were getting worse and worse. But God was working it all out, and Augustine laughs at God later on at how, how wisely and how brilliantly he was working things out, despite uh, what it looked like at the moment. So God says to us in the prophet Isaiah, I will lead the blind in a way they know not. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. And so he was. He was working everything out. So if you have somebody that you're praying for, or, or many people that you're praying for, or maybe yourself too, and you think that God isn't answering it, well, God is working things out in his own brilliant way. One thing that's very important for us always is to remember that God delights in our prayers, that God is this wonderful infinite fire of love and goodness. And an infinite fire of love and goodness isn't going to be simply indifferent to, to his people praying, that, that when God uh, listens to us, he doesn't say, are you doing that right now? Are you praying enough? Are you praying long enough? Are you fasting enough? No, God delights in what we, in what we do and how we pray. So a hundred years ago, there was a great Catholic writer and journalist by the name of G.K. Chesterton. And he asked, among his many questions, he said, do you think God is interested in new inventions like aeroplanes, which were at that stage about 10 years old, and uh, automobiles? He said, God has much greater inventions like rabbits and grass and things like that. And he's, he asked this question, he said, why do chickens lay eggs? And his answer was that when God created the first chicken and saw that the chicken lay the egg, God said, do it again. Wow. So the chicken did it again. And when the chicken did it again a second time, God said, do it again. And what Chesterton is trying to bring across is how God takes a childlike delight in all his creation. And we see this, he says, in, in the flowers. That for us, the flowers are all the same. They're all one is a repetition of the other. But for God, God never gets tired of these flowers, which are all unfolding uh, miracles of his creation. And he says that, you know, adults get tired of things that are repeated all the time, but children don't. So your, your child or, or your nephew or your niece, when you throw them up into the air, they give a shriek of delight and they say, do it again. And of course, we are exhausted because we're adults, but they don't get tired. And God never gets tired either. God creates the whole world, generation after generation, star after star in heaven, flower after flower in the ground, and he never gets tired in it because he delights in his creation with a childlike delight. And th this isn't just Chesterton going mad. This is in the Bible too. So there's that beautiful line in the Psalms, the Lord delights in his people. And it goes on, he crowns the poor with salvation. And then the Psalm tells us how we should react. It says, let the faithful rejoice in their glory, shout for joy, and take their rest. So God is very excited by us. And there's a wonderful line in the book of Proverbs where Jesus, speaking as the Old Testament figure of wisdom, speaks of himself during the creation of the world, the Father creating the world. And he says, then was I beside him, beside the Father, like a master workman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. And then Jesus says, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of men. So when we come in here, the Lord looks at our prayers. He looks at us coming from there from the tabernacle and he says, I am delighted to see you. I am delighted to see you. And maybe just at this point in time, we might take two or three seconds of silence just to 
believe in that. To believe in that, that the Lord says to us when we come to him in prayer, in our homes, and especially here in church, I am delighted to see you. So to pray for those that we have in mind, whether for their conversion or for anything else, for their health and their well-being and their happiness, can often be the most difficult thing in the world. Isn't that right? Because we all get tired of it and we've all got other things to do and we sort of say to ourselves, well, I prayed for them yesterday, didn't I? So I'm not going to bother doing that today. And it can often be difficult in many different ways because God delays in answering our prayers, just like he delayed in St. Monica and St. Augustine for years and years. He, he can delay in answering our prayers. And so it becomes very difficult. It would be very easy if we could say to God, okay, God, I want this, and we need it in three weeks. And we could be quite sure that God would have it to us in three weeks, or else it'll be a disaster. I don't have time to spare. Okay, this, this, thing, this thing can't wait. But ceaselessly to pray for people, to pray for people every day, having them on a list, and taking the time to think about them, to give them that time of prayer and intercession can be very difficult. And it can be very difficult because it requires a lot of love. So it's easy to, to look at, to think of someone often and to feel very passionate about them for a short period. But what if God says to us, what about loving them for a long period? And so day after day, month after month, year after year, we repeat their names before God. We think of them every day. We can't simply forget them in the way we'd like to. We can't simply take no time for them and go on to do other things that are more interesting, like going to work or, or having a coffee. But we have to think of them. And it becomes really difficult. But when it becomes difficult, God is measuring our love for them. And so our intercession and our prayer for them, God isn't delaying for no reason, but he's delaying so that we are building up our love. And in the same way, when we pray for somebody after, over years and years, it can be very difficult because God takes his time and we lose faith. And we say to ourselves, well, obviously that's run into a, 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 a cul-de-sac or that's run into a blank wall there and God isn't answering that. And maybe God is saying to us, do you still believe? Years later, do you still believe? Years and years later, do you still believe? So I remember just recently saying to, a woman was saying to me about her, her son, that she had been praying for him. And I said, well, remember St. Monica? She had to pray for years. And she said, well, St. Monica only had to pray for 17 years. I'm 25 years now already praying for my son. So... What's, the, what's God looking for there is, is greater faith. And this faith that we build up, and we build up a habit of faith, we build up a habit of concrete, rock-solid faith over years and years. And God is waiting for us, maybe, for that faith. And I think as well, there's another thing that we have to remember. And that's that we're all human beings. And when we look into ourselves, we all know that we're very deep inside, don't we? We all know that we've got all sorts of emotions and passions and inhibitions and fears and joys and desires and God has to work through all these things if he's trying to change someone so it's true that that God at certain stages in history especially with Saint Paul as the classic example will convert people just like that and he'll give them infused knowledge so that they they're completely changed overnight but for most of us God likes to work with our humanity and so he takes passion by passion and emotion by emotion and desire by desire. And this takes years and years because each of us is so deep in our hearts and our souls. And God works with that, not as, as if we were simply figures on a, in a movie or something like that, but really as we are in all the depths of our humanity. So a Dominican brother once told me this story that he was working in a hospital in New York if I'm not mistaken, and he was with a family whose child was dying. So you know yourselves that there's nothing so tragic as when, a, when in, a, in a death as when a child dies. 
And when, when it was clear that he was on the verge of dying, this little boy, the family began to say the rosary, and they thought he'd be dead before the end of the first decade. But when it came to the first decade, he was still alive. And so it went on in the second and third and fourth decade. They were waiting for him to die, and yet on, their, on went their prayers until the fifth decade. And then they said the Hail Holy Queen. And just at the words, Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us, and after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. It was at that point that the child died. And of course, in, in this sadness, the family knew that this was a little sign, that they had just been praying to the Blessed Virgin, show after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And they felt, at least that in all their sorrow at seeing this child die, that nonetheless, Our Lady and God had been looking at them and looking after them. And also that they had been listening to their prayers, that God had been listening very carefully to their prayers. So we ourselves, you know, we, we pray and we pray, and often we're not too sure about the prayers we say. They pass through our heads, and of course they're all by rote now. But sometimes we get little indications that God listens to everything. That even when we lose concentration, he is listening. And every single prayer that we say is infinitely precious to him. Because it's perfectly true as well that nothing we could say would ever really be valuable to God. Because God is so infinitely great. But it's his infinite love for us and his delight in us that gives value to everything we say. And every little prayer, every Hail Mary we say, every Our Father we say is precious in the eyes of God. So, brothers and sisters, we should never lose faith in any way. But remember that, as St. Augustine used to laugh at God and how wise God was in listening to his mother, loving his mother's prayers, but not granting them right now, that we too should never lose faith in our prayers. But every prayer we say is of infinite value to God. Every prayer we say is precious to God. And we should never tire but grow in faith and grow in love through our prayers for our beloved over the years. We want to finish with the prayer then to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many but the Church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations and sufferings and particularly this request. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. Saint Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.